It was just like the most gut-wrenching feeling I've ever had in my life. Even though I've been sad and I've had those really dark places of grief, I don't regret what I did at all. Hi, welcome to Life Is It Just Me, the podcast and now YouTube series where we focus on the big talking points in life. This first season is all about the decision as to whether to have kids. I'm joined today by Ryan as always. Hi, Ryan. Hello, I'm here again. You are. Good to have you, mate. And also we're joined today as well by our guest, Olivia. Hi, Olivia. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. You're in your car. Are you going to be comfortable yeah. for this? Yeah, no, I'll be good. I'm good. <laughs> okay. well, if you want to stop and get out and stretch your legs, then just let us okay. know. No, Olivia, it's a comfortable car, so I'm good. <laughs> well, take your what It looks a comfortable car. It does. Yeah. Um, Olivia, set the scene for us. Tell us a bit about yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? Um, sure. So um, I'm from northeastern United States, from Pennsylvania. Um, I'm 21. Anything, anything else? You know, nothing too crazy. I'm in college, so university, you know. Oh, yeah. Are you studying? Um, well, I still haven't decided my major yet. Um, I go to art school, so either photography or sculpture or both. Yeah. I think there's a lot of work in the creative arts still. I know there's, um, yeah. uh, I actually watched a really bad Christmas movie um, through the, the festive period. So there was about mm -hmm. a couple um, that wanted to do photography and ended up owning a shop together and that was their dream. Yeah. And it was just, oh. it was it was like, um, yes, creativity is still a job, you know, trying to yeah. push that whole thing. Yeah, so. yeah. despite I mean, the whole... This, so hopefully. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Despite the whole COVID thing, which has obviously decimated so many industries, so fingers crossed things improve yeah. over the coming years for you. Yeah. Definitely. We're here to talk today, as we have been this whole season, about the decision as to whether to have kids. And Olivia, you're here, you're on board because it's safe to say that 2020 has been a bit of a year for all of us, but you in particular, you found mm -hmm. yourself pregnant partway through 2020 in yeah. circumstances that you probably couldn't believe. Tell us yeah. the story, please. Um, so, yeah, back in May, so probably like halfway through quarantine-ish, um, I, you know, I kind of knew. Everyone was like, you know, my friends were like, okay, just calm down. Like, maybe you're just being a little bit anxious. Like, it's probably okay. Um, I've always, like, I don't know if it's too much information, but I've always had, like, an irregular cycle. So everyone was kind of like, you know how your body is. Like, just give a little time. You're probably being overdramatic. Um, and I think it's hard because like the same symptoms of pregnancy are the same as like when you're about to get your period. So it was like a little bit dicey <laughs> and my partner was like, I'm sure it's fine. Like, you know, you're an anxious person. And I was like, just trust me. Like there's, I have this gut feeling that something is up. Um, I remember I went to his house and we took the test and I just like, I made him look first cause I was really scared <laughs> and I just, he was silent and I was like, oh, like I just, the emotions that came over me, I was so overwhelmed, sad, scared. I was just, I was honestly a little angry because I had an IUD and I was like, I'm totally fine. Everything's good. And then it obviously wasn't all good. Um, and I think, and then we took another test. I was like, maybe it's just wrong. Um, and then <laughs> it wasn't obviously. And so like I emailed my doctor that day, emailed my therapist. I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, but I think like, my partner and I both knew what the answer was before we even really talked about it. Um, yeah. Okay. That, I mean, you spoke about a lot of emotions, a bit of anger, a bit of sadness. Was there any, mm -hmm. was there any positive emotions at that time or was it all sort of fear and, and, and worry? And I think it was like, it's hard because it was like a lot of conflicting things. Like, I love my partner dearly and we've talked about having kids like before this and like how we both want to have kids and like we're very committed to each other um and I think we were both like it's it's hard because like this is something we want in the future and now is just like not the right time which sounds kind of like selfish to say but then we were also like you know even if we did go through with this and we decide to, like go through the pregnancy like we're so young I'm 21 and we are like, how good of a life can we really give a child right now? Like, we're not financially independent. We're both still in school. We don't even live together. Like, not only for us, but I think a lot of it was, like, for this other person that we would bring into our lives, into the world. Like, would they really have, like, the life, the quality of life they deserve, if that makes sense? Yeah. 
No, it Absolutely. does make sense. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, I'm a few more years on. I'm 28, almost 29, and I don't know if I want to have kids yet. That's part of the reason yeah. for this this podcast, as I've been saying all along. And I worry about those things, and I, I, I am financially secure. I am in a relationship similar to you, and I still don't know whether or not that's something that I can ever give. Ryan, can you relate? You obviously are a bit ahead of us. You've got got kids. Um, yeah, obviously, yeah. I'm in a different situation now. I'm a bit further down the, the story. But um, I feel like um, in my younger days, it was the, the same kind of experiences where um, there was pregnancy scares and things like that. With I know this pregnancy scare makes it sound like it's a bad thing, but... Um, <laughs> But as a young, a, a young guy who was in the same position as you, didn't have any financial stability and things like that, it, it, it would be easy um, to, to, to to think of it as a bad thing at the time. Um, so I, I think that is the takeaway for me. It's not the same for everybody. It's all about timing for the individual, and um, it's so it makes total sense um, to me. Like why you would say oh we're, we're not in a position where um we feel we're ready for that um I obviously wasn't planned because you thought you had all your your yeah kinda, <laughs> you thought you had all your your birth control in 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 place and uh so yeah for me uh life is different now obviously i've got, I've got two kids and my life is kind of it ro- rotates around them they, they rule the house <laughs> Um, so it is a different time for me now, but I can completely relate to like being in in your position because I'm I'm what now? I don't really want like to say my age on the internet. But, <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> to Some big numbers coming up. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge. You need to get a calculator right now. Um, I'm uh, in my mid to late thirties, so my that, was, that is, was a cop out. That really that was, was a cop out. I did say uh, <laughs> mid to late. I mean, uh, how, how, how much more information do you need? Late to mid forties, um, almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, definitely. I I, I totally get it because we. I was ready when I was about thirty. I felt ready to be a dad at thirty. Um, I think if it had been earlier than that, I'd have probably been. Uh, on the fence, definitely. Just kind of, it's it's not ideal, especially sure. if it'd been a couple of years earlier. I think I'd have been like, can we make this work um, financially and just logistically? I lived in a really small apartment flat, um, and it was one bedroom, and it just wasn't. It was, it's not a place mm-hmm. to bring up uh, a child. Not not the place I wanted to bring up a child. Anyway, I mean, people do it, but sure. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I definitely, definitely can relate. Um, just have have been through the, the same things you guys are talking about, and the um, moments where we had these discussions and had to make decisions and things like that. So, um, but right now, I, my life is totally different, and I'm enjoying being a dad and being a parent and it sounds like that that's something you're looking for in the future as well so mm-hmm. when circumstances are when circumstances are right. fit what what works for you mm-hmm. so yeah um, i definitely like definitely want to be a parent so exactly so there's i mean for, for us i mean this we do this podcast because um mainly for selfish reasons for paul for him to figure out whether he wants a kid um but <laughs> uh, this this not whole series is, has been <clears throat> no it's, it's not just that i'm just but mostly I'm, that. I'm teasing paul i'm teasing <laughs> paul um it has been a, a kind of an open love letter for paul for for figuring out his his situation which is kind of nice mm-hmm. um it's given yeah. us a real reason to do it so, Olivia, thank you for sharing. You you spoke before about how this year has just been so mad and you found yourself pregnant in the craziest of circumstances despite having mm-hmm. an IUD, despite having birth control. Not only that, but you'd been given some shocking news with regards to pregnancies yeah. just a couple of months prior. Mm-hmm. So back in February, um, my doctor told me many years ago that she thought I had like polycystic ovarian syndrome. My sister has it too. Um, I never had like the proper ultrasound and I got one last year, like about this time. And so in February, like I just wasn't feeling well. I went to the doctor, like unrelated to this entirely. And my doctor like examined me and whatever. And she was like, oh, by the way, like we looked at your ultrasound and it's going to be really hard for you to get pregnant if you get pregnant at all. And I was like, 
I was not prepared for this information, but <laughs> okay. Um, and I think that it was a big blow. I like was really on the fence about having kids, not really on the fence, but um, certainly before I met my partner, I was like, I don't think I want to have kids at all. Um, and if I do, I want to adopt. And then once I met my partner, he is like really, kids are really important to him. It was like one of the, we talked about it like very early in our relationship, honestly, because it is so important to him. Um, and so when I found that out, I think he was more upset than I was, um, actually. And for me, I think it was the kind of thing where like, you know, I was 20 years old at the time and I was like, I never even had to, I didn't think I had to think about this now. <laughs> um, and then like getting that news, I think it was more that I was upset that I didn't have the option really anymore. Or if I did, it was going to a be expensive and a lengthy process. And like, even people I work with are like, you should freeze your eggs now. And I was like, I'm literally 20 years old. I don't <laughs> know. Like, you know, it was just a very overwhelming experience. Um, and then I still was like, well, I know I'm not ready right now for sure. So I'm still going to have the ID and like all that. Um, and yeah, then a couple months later I was pregnant. So it was just a crazy couple months. Uh, that's a roller coaster of a, a thing mm -hmm. to go through, isn't it? Just one, yeah. one way going. <laughs> well, it's too extreme. So let's face it. Yeah. Completely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Completely. I also think that like it played into my emotions when I did decide to terminate my pregnancy because I was like, what if this is my fluke and what if this is my one chance and like what if this is not going to happen again yeah. um and like i'm what if i'm taking this away from my partner who like desperately wants to be a parent and i think that was a really hard thing to have to cope with of being like you know what if it is my only opportunity and this opportunity doesn't happen again um, what how did you like an extra layer yeah how did you reconcile that kind of thought process because obviously, um, if you're thinking, uh, we're not ready for this now, but then if it's the only chance we've got, mm -hmm. then how, how do you weigh that up? How does anyone weigh that up? But how did you? Um, honestly, I think the reasons to not have a kid right now or a child right now were like so overwhelming that, and like also I think a big, especially for my partner, I think his big motivator was like, we're not going to have this child is not going to have a great childhood because like, look at where we are in our lives. We're, we're still practically children. Like, <laughs> you know, there's no. So it's Paul. Don't like, worry about it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> you Thank know, you. I, we were both living with our parents in the middle of a pandemic, like just the worst time. Um, and we were kind of like, even if this is our one chance, a, there's many ways to make a family. Like we can adopt, there's other things we can do and be like this kid that might be our only chance, sure, wouldn't have the childhood that we want to give it because of where we are in life. Sure. And but it's, it's, some some, it's still something that like when I think about it, it's hard to think about. Yeah, of course. And that sort of brings me on to talking about the decision and where to go. So you spoke about finding out that you were pregnant and those emotions which which hit you guys all at once it sounds like that was very much a shared experience as well with you and your partner mm -hmm. how did you get from taking those two tests as it turned out to be to okay we're gonna vote we're gonna have a termination it was kind of instant to be honest there was not a lot of back and forth about it we actually not that i'm like thinking about in like the two weeks leading up to taking the test I had asked him, he was not as nervous as I was. And I was like, so if this is a situation, what do you want to do? Cause it's not something we've ever talked about before. I'm definitely more liberal than him, like politically. And it's not something that's ever really, we don't even dating for six months at the time. And we like, uh -huh. yeah, we had, a, we've had a pretty fast relationship and we like, sounds corny, but like fell hard and fast for each other <laughs> and all that. Um, and it's not something that ever really, came up and so I was kind of like what if this ruins our relationship because I don't know his beliefs like this is really important to me it's something that I'm very passionate about and I was like what if he tells me he can't we I couldn't have an abortion and I was like kind of panicked in the moment but I asked him and he was like I'm pretty sure we, we should have an abortion I was like okay and then what actually did happen it was kind of an instant. We just kind of looked at each other and we like kind of knew what had to happen. And we both like cried before we even really said anything. Um, and like, I think we made the decision really like the same day. 
And then I still had like a week in between we made the decision and like the, when I was actually going to have the procedure. Um, and I think that week was a lot of, he was very positive. Like, this is what we're doing. It's the right thing to do. Very confident in the choice. And for me, I was like, I needed a lot of reassurance from him that I was like, we're doing the right thing. And I knew in my gut that it was the right thing, but I think like superficially, I was like, I need you to tell me that we're doing the right thing. And I need you to remind me that we're doing the right thing. Um, Did you need that reassurance because you weren't sure if he was being completely honest about his thought processes or was it more because of how you were feeling just a little bit insecure about it? Or? I think both. I think yeah. I really did need reassurance from him that like he was agreeing to this decision from his own like heart and his own gut and not just because he loves me because you know I was worried about that I guess I was worried he was making a choice that he was gonna regret in the long run and hate me for and it was gonna you know tear us apart pretty much and so I think I needed reassurance from him in that way and I needed reassurance for myself that like I wasn't gonna have to live with some horrible guilt and regret okay all, all valid things to think about obviously I mean it's of course it's, it's it's a big decision and also um also kind of not as well <laughs> it's it's one of those like real Pandora's box kind of conundrums where it's it's a big decision because obviously it can lead to to life down down the road but also mm -hmm. it's right now your own situation it's about us can we do it um and it's a it's almost like this is the easiest decision in the world based on our situation but also one of the hardest decisions we'll ever have to make mm -hmm. and it's 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 a real balancing act of emotions and thought processes and i think that there's not enough credit given to to that like the That's strength huge. of mind that it takes to battle with that that kind of it's a paradox it's, it really yeah. is yeah so and I don't think people are given enough credit for that thought process and that thing. Um, whether you stand on, uh, with, I know in America you you know as well that there's <laughs> such a, a kind of anti-abortion thing and anti, mm -hmm. a more a very big pro-life movement in America. And um, the problem with that is I think there's there's no thought process into the the actual kind of mechanics of it. So I, this is off topic a little bit, but I'm just, <laughs> my thought presses is go everywhere. We'll just deal with it. Okay. Told you it doesn't stick to plans, but it's okay. <laughs> I yeah. do not stick to plans. I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, I went to the Bodies exhibition. Um, it's an exhibit that was uh, in New York. It was in, uh, it doesn't matter where it was, but the point is, um, it was, it's one of these things that it's like a life-changing thing to go and see. Um, and it's, it, it was controversial in its time as well because it, it, it was showing like people's actual people's bodies without the skin on them and it was showing it's a really cool thing if you go and look it up if you don't know anything about it but i have no idea um, <laughs> it's, it's called the bodies exhibition and it's okay. i'm writing it's, it down. Um, <laughs> yeah honestly look it up if you've never heard of it but um it was like one of those wow this is really cool. i've got a very scientific brain i i compartmentalize everything i always want to know the cause and effect i'm very very like clinical analytical thinker in that respect so this was like a proper science fest for me i, I went in and thought how is this allowed like how 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 are they allowed to have actual real life human bodies on show which are dissected and um cut down the middle or like proper cross sections of people and like real people so it was obviously something that had been brought over from like the eastern part of the world as an exhibition but it was so cool i <laughs> thought it was really cool because of my scientific brain um but they had a section and it was they had a section that you could bypass if you were feeling like you couldn't cope with it and the section was about fertility and this how a baby is um created and they had basically it was test tubes that were all lined up like, um, and it had all the developmental stages from wow. the, basically from the the very first kind of uh, zygote of an egg, mm -hmm. and then all the way up to actual fetus, and you could see every stage all the way. It was I, 
properly eye-opening. Now, I think I was about 25 when I saw this, so even older than you are now. So <laughs> in my scientific <laughs> brain, I was like, wow, like everybody should see this. Like mm. Everybody should be able to have a look and see how the mechanics of the human body works like this. Because again, as a, as a man, I don't, I don't know if we're the target audience for some kind of um, sex education or, or, or you know, you know, sometimes they, they think, oh, it's, it's fine. Um, you don't need to know that. Yeah. Let the women um, sort that out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, whereas I was never like that. Um, we, in Scotland, uh, it was quite progressive. We had sex education when we were still in primary school, which for you guys is like before you even go to... I don't even know what it is. I'm sorry. I was going to pretend like... <laughs> elementary school, though. Um, yeah, yeah, kind of elementary. Like elementary school. Yeah. Um, so we had that in the kind of la last year of elementary school. Um, not even the last year. I think it was primary six, Paul. Yeah, which I, think, yeah I think we were the same. Yeah, about... What um, age would you be? About maybe 10, 11 years old? Yeah, 10 or 11. And they were giving us all this information about the body and then later on about... Um, sex education and even and how the body works for for pregnancy and things so for me my kind of interest was sparked then just like oh and there's mm. science behind all this mm -hmm. um and i know i've gone off on a real big tangent here but the point was being able to see it visually properly in front of you um how, how the body works and how the different de developmental stages are there is a definite point along that that thing you know how i think in this country it's 12 weeks they, they don't want you to have an abortion past 12 weeks mm -hmm. is that right paul is that am i i don't know am i right now um i think it's 12 weeks and um and the, and you could see with this visual kind of science thing that sort of, <laughs> um after 12 weeks you can see why because you can start to see like the spine and fingertips mm -hmm. and like the like actual it actually starting to look like something that would even resemble a human being um but up until that point it was just and the first test tube was like a ball of spit it just looked that's what it looked like and then as it progressively went on and you saw how quickly the weeks developed um but that's a visual that i will carry with me for the rest of my life and i'd like I don't to see know that why i don't exactly i don't know why it's not like widely like put out there as a, a, doc, a documentation on like, look, this is this is the process. This is week one, two, three. And I think it's something you go looking for when you actually are pregnant or when you're when you're in the sure. middle of being of doing it. But um I wonder if it's because kids, it's sorry, I wonder if it's because it's so it's so raw. It literally is this is how every single one of us came about. And that yeah. can make so many people uncomfortable. I can imagine I so many people bypassing what is, that. What is more, um, yeah, there was a lot of people who were like, I don't want to go in there. Yeah. And even the people who did come in were like, yeah, I'm leaving this room pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. But um, I've just had a look at For on, me. Go on. Oh, did you look up? Yeah, I, was gonna, I just had a look on the um, National Health Service. That's the health service in the UK. And generally, abortions are carried out before 24 weeks of pregnancy. Oh, it can be carried out after 24 weeks, but in very limited circumstances is generally how the health service here works. Where, where were you um, when it, at your stage? I know we're kind of skipping ahead a little bit here. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think I was eight weeks. Okay. Yeah, about eight weeks, somewhere so in there. Very early on. So. Yeah. Um, I think most people don't even really know they're pregnant until about that time. Okay. Because yeah. they like the way they count it from like your last period yeah. would be at least four weeks already. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I think the cultural difference between Britain and America is obviously very, yeah. very different. I can't. I mean, it seems weird to me that this is an exhibition I saw in America. It was I in know. Europe. Definitely, I was thinking the same thing. So, um, like, I, yeah, it's not like I saw it down the street in Scotland. It was. It was <laughs> I was in no. America, and um, we were doing we were doing the Rockefeller Center and all the touristy mm. stuff. And then one of mm -hmm. this body's exhibition came up. They're like, "Do you want to go and see this?" And I was like is that a thing <laughs> so yeah I'll definitely go. i do um definitely i put my eyes like yeah we're going to that um and we had something on tv that had been similar here i don't know if you remember it paul there had been a, a thing with a, it was a doctor who used to wear like a cowboy hat style thing or like a an like outback so. hat and he used to dissect bodies like in like 
in the same way that this exhibition yeah, yeah anyway we got off topic i'm really sorry but i wanted to say that okay. it was really useful it was. <laughs> to see this visual I think, um i mean i don't know i think like going back to kind of like the choice of doing it all i think it's really easy to get sucked into the pro-life propaganda i will also say that yeah. about living in the states i don't know what it's like in the uk in terms of like that kind of information but like it kind of especially with our election that just happened like being bombarded like i felt like i couldn't escape those images and that like rhetoric of how bad of a person i was for doing that um and i think that you know having that idea in my head of like what people were going to think of who i was made it really really hard as well is that yeah part of the reason we're doing this podcast anonymously um for obvious obvious reasons and uh, who who else knows aside from well us and your your partner yeah i mean my family doesn't know his family doesn't know um i have two good friends who know and that's that's pretty much it yeah is that because of the reasons you've just said about yeah so much judgment and like i mean obviously like my doctor and my therapist and all those people know um but like there's so much judgment here about it and so much like someone's opinion of you based on that one choice changes like that um it's, you can again, be the best person in the us. world yeah yeah it's and like it is, it's everywhere it's like billboards about it you know over the summer we went to the beach and we we're walking on the boardwalk and there was like a sign on the boardwalk that was like make the right choice and like you know don't be a sinner and all that kind of stuff i'm not i'm not catholic or christian but what state are you in olivia i'm in pennsylvania that's okay yeah. so you, i mean uh, you, and i'm not i'm not picking on any states at all but like <laughs> pennsylvania it, it's not it doesn't come to my mind as being right like a state that would be like harsh against yeah abortions but um but even like online like you know people saying just horrible things about people and like sharing images of like what a fetus looks like after it's been aborted or like that it'll feel pain like stuff like that that's just like not scientifically even based in real things but i think in the place that i was in where my self-esteem about it was already so low it was so easy for that to just take me like further and further down of this like maybe everything is right that these people are saying maybe i am horrible and maybe i you know did something awful and i think that just made it it's already hard to do, deal with and to go through and then you add this extra layer of all the politics and what people say and like even still I remember after so then the whole thing with the iud made this all another complicated layer because my id was like missing from my okay. and they were like well it could just be in your body somewhere and like perforated your uterus so i had to go and have an x-ray okay. That's helpful. And yeah, exactly. I was like another like icing on the cake of this whole situation. Um, so so no, I had to go, and get go it. back to that though. Did, did, have, they, have they found it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they were like, it just Whew. must have fallen out, which seems bizarre to me, but I'm not a doctor. So well, um, yeah, I, 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 I guess it's to, just kind of stitched in. So like, a, a yeah, stitch could it's just be, kind of like yeah. shoved up there, I guess. And, you know, <laughs> kind of gory terms. But um, we I can went deal to the doctor. That. Yeah. So I went to the radiologist to go get my x ray. And I think it was the first time I had to tell somebody and I like it, it took even to a doctor who like you should be able to trust with anything. Like I'm a very open book with my doctors. People are like, I can't believe you know, when I was under 21, people are like you tell your doctor that you drink and that you smoke. And I was like, they're my <laughs> doctor. So yeah. But like with this one thing, it was like, I, they were like, are you pregnant? And I was like, no, but, and it like took me a second to like okay. kind of get that information out. And that's happened a couple of times where like I'm with a healthcare professional and like, that's just the level of fear. I think yeah. people have about sharing this kind of information here. It's been instilled is... in you as well since, mm -hmm. since you were young, mm -hmm. I'm guessing you've grown up Definitely. with this. This is yeah. systemic in the country. Definitely. I, again, I don't think it is quite as, as harsh as that here in Britain. No, it's um, definitely not. Like I got, Again, there are extremes on both sides where people who are pro or anti, but it's just kind of, it seems to me that, like, we try not to make judgments on this on this podcast. Sure. Like, which yeah. we, um, but it's hard. Like, as a person, 
I'm sat here thinking, why in a situation that's difficult enough for you, <laughs> to, right. would anybody want to make that harder? Like, right. That that is my kind of point of view on that. Sure, and sure. I'm, um, again, it's a, it's a choice that you have made. Not, I don't think it's selfish. I think it's it's a choice you made because things aren't right for you right now. And again, I can relate to that because. I don't. I think I would have been a in a, a horrible father in my in my early twenties. Yeah. Like I, I honestly think like I've, I mean I'm, I might be a horrible father now. But, <laughs> ask your kids. Um, <laughs> I'll have to ask my kids when um, when they're a bit older how much I messed them up. But um, yeah, I'd, it's difficult. I mean, you, yeah. you're in those formative years. You're not through college yet. You want to kind of obviously get out of the family home this year has been absolutely insane anyway um yeah. for one reason or another and <laughs> um but i mean for for covid even if we're just going to single out a reason um some people even that would weigh on my mind because we had a conversation with somebody who is is very pregnant and is going to be having a baby very soon um and she said that this was a perfect time for having a baby because everybody was kind of not at work anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> and then, and, and but in the same thought process, I was like, well, would you want to bring a baby into this shambles of a, of a world right now when nobody knows what's going on? And there's, there's a very real kind of virus going around. That's not, not good for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and and then again, even with that in America, I know that there's some very strong anti um, uh, kind of it's fake news that there is a virus and mm -hmm. it's very much not happening. And um, here as well. Right. And well, they're, oh, yeah. starting to, they're getting that way now here as well. But um, I can understand why um, for us, a conservative government who is very much about business and privatization would be wanting to shut down the country and not have all of that going on mm, have a good so reason like, for it there, there must be something mm. <laughs> um our our government the same way it's set up is not very socialist at the moment so there's no way that they would be paying people to be not at work they just would <laughs> right. there's something that's not real um that's my th thoughts on that as well so i'm gonna get a lot of hate mail for this episode but <laughs> let's disguise um, your email address I mean, I <laughs> and then we we'll just I... disguise my face <laughs> 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 no, I think, like, a huge reason. Also, like, I'm not going to lie, like, physical safety as well. Like, that's yeah. why I want to remain anonymous. Like, just, I mean, I, I'm, again, I'm not a judgmental person. I really try to, like, I am not a hateful person. I try to, like, have love in my heart for everyone. But I think yeah. people, like, it's such a polarizing issue. And people, I think if I, people... You know, if I wasn't anonymous, I think like I would be scared for my physical safety about someone finding out where I work, where I go to school, where I live, any of the above. And I think like that that's, you know, obviously no one should have to deal with that. But I think it's, yeah, definitely just another scary part of it. What do you fear would happen if you were to be recognized? Um, I think the most thing I'd be most worried about would be someone hurting me or my partner. To okay. be honest, I think like physically, that would be terrifying. Yeah. To be hurt for the choice that you've made. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. Even more than people telling me I'm a bad person, I'm a murderer, X, Y, and Z, whatever you want to say. Um, living in like constant fear of my physical safety is obviously not something I really want to go through. Like while I'm different. trying to heal from like having an abortion and also like trying to deal with, you know, that it just, you know too much <laughs> it's been very interesting so far this is i think maybe our ninth or tenth episode i'm not sure and yeah we're we've, now. we've we've had a, a huge amount of various stories people who are struggling to conceive people who are about to give birth and various different factors and i was saying to ryan and i think as well to you olivia this this particular topic of abortion has been single-handedly the most difficult one for us to find a guest someone you in this case who is willing to talk about it and i just want to say just as part way through how, how yeah, grateful i am for you coming on and, and doing this because i know yeah. i know just based on what you've said there how much it means to you and i know part of the reason for you agreeing to do so is because 
you have been faced with so much negativity and you want for your own sake and for others who are going through similar things you want to get your experience out there and uh, we'll talk later yeah. on about some of the more kind of negative experiences you've had online and how we came to know each other but just thought it was quite a, an important point yeah. just to make because I mean, it's a big a big deal um i also like we talked about this before but like it's there's no support about it if you try to get if you're looking for something online about abortion you're gonna get the only things you really can find are political and are hateful and the only place i've found that is a helpful what tool to heal and get information is the reddit that paul found me on um there's nothing there's no support there's no real like literature or anything helpful like how do you cope with this and how do you deal with it after and like the questions that i've had of just like message like texting my two friends who know and them being like i've never been through this but i'm here to help you i'm here to support you i don't know what this is like i don't know anybody who knows you know how to deal with this and i wish that like my partner and i talked about it like we wish there was something you know like this that would have been some some help or some kind of like reassurance that you're not the only person in the world who's going through it that's kind of what it felt like that's the reason we're doing this but it really strikes me that for you to have gone through what you've gone through that you effectively are speaking to two strangers on the internet in your car to help other yeah. people yeah to help you know else. yeah yeah exactly that that that, that feels strange to say that. Yeah, I I said that to my partner. I was like, <laughs> so I'm a little nervous because I'm about to tell this very vulnerable part of my life that no one really knows about to two strangers that I met on Reddit, which seems like <laughs> so insane <laughs> you say it like that. Like, insane. But, I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. If that it is helps even is. one person, then I think I could get yeah. 50, someone could find out who I was and I'll get 50 hate messages. And if one person is helped by this, then I think it's worth it. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing so far. It's been such an insight um, for, for all of us. And I want to take you back. We spoke about finding out you're pregnant and your, your partner and yourself knowing that um, terminating was the right decision for you both. What was the decision process, decision making process like once you decided, okay, we're going to have an abortion? Where did you go from there? Um, well, I, so after I talked to my doctor, I'm really lucky that, so the doctor that I go to is like part of a hospital network. Um, and so they're in the hospital is like a family planning clinic. And that's really all they do. And that's where I got my birth control, my IUD. Um, and so I called them and I told them the situation um and they kind of just walked me through it. it was a little weird because of covid i mean i knew i mean honestly they, they didn't even give me the option to do a medical abortion so they were like okay you'll come in on this day for your procedure um and i don't know what it's normally like when it's not covid weird times or trying to minimize contact in the hospital but as far as i know most of the time they're supposed to have you come in and talk to you and give you all this stuff about like you can choose adoption and you can do this and you can do that um and there is a 24-hour waiting period so i had to like talk to someone on the phone like two days before and they like talked me through everything and then i was like okay and then i like could go in for my appointment um but anyway so i mean i'm glad i did the surgical abortion because it's like over like it's one and done and you're in the you know room with the doctors and the nurses and it's over and it's done and they can check to make sure it was complete and you don't have to like have that anxiety. Um, and also I didn't want to do it at home. Like obviously no one knew what was going on. Um, and I think a lot of it was just like the pain of like, when you have medical abortion, it's like hours and hours and hours of just like excruciating pain. And I'm not going to lie. Like I, it was very painful surgical abortion, but it was over, you know, it was, 30 seconds a minute maybe and it was done um and so that's kind of like why i decided to go that route um yeah okay let's talk if we can as as well about the actual day itself sure. so you, mm -hmm. you you made the decision or the decision almost was made for you that it was going to be um a surgical procedure 
mm-hmm. how long after that did the procedure actually happen and what was the, the build up like? What were the emotions you yeah. felt? And... Um, so I made the appointment about a week before the procedure and I was kind of surprised at how fast everything kind of just like happened. Um, like from the time I found out I was pregnant to the time I had my abortion was probably a week and a half. Um, okay. So it all was pretty fast. Um, it was actually, this is like, hurts my heart a little bit. Like when I think about the timeline, the weekend before was my partner's birthday. And so we took a trip, just the two of us to, I have tissues because I'm probably going to get emotional, but um, okay. <laughs> we took a trip for his birthday. Like I planned it. He loves to like camp and like hike and everything. And so we went like three hours away and we like had a little cabin. It was just the two of us for the weekend. And I think it was like kind of a surreal experience where it was just like just the two of us together and like trying to have a good weekend, the two of us for his birthday and trying to not ignore what was going on. Um, but like, also I was like very, very ill. I like had terrible, terrible nausea, the whole like and morning sickness and just like feeling exhausted. And I felt awful. Cause like, I like to hike too. And it's like kind of something we enjoy together. And I like just, I couldn't do it. And I was trying to like power through because I was like, it's your birthday. And I want to like, you know, make sure you have a good birthday. And I was like struggling and like beating myself up because I, I just felt bad that I like wasn't functioning. And I kind of like had to take a point of like, not totally using humor to like get through it, but like, I think we couldn't focus on it the whole time. And I, there's one conversation that we had that I will like never forget. And it was like late at night and we were driving back to our little cabin and my partner was driving and he looked at me and he said, if I died tomorrow, what would you do? And I was like, that's a heavy, heavy question. And I was like, I would keep it because it's not like, it's not that I don't want to have a kid with you. It's not that I don't have love for you. It's not that I am not in love with you. It's like, this is not the right time for you and me. And I think just like the days leading up to it were, were really hard. And it was hard to think about and like, trying to give it the attention it deserved and also not let it overwhelm us. Um, and I think the day of, it was probably one of the hardest days of my entire life. It was, it was awful. I mean, I told my mom, I was like, you know, he's going to come pick me up in the morning. It's time to go to the city for an appointment. And we drove like probably 45 minutes to the hospital. Um, and I had, you have to have like a blood test beforehand um to like check I don't know I wasn't really even following what the person on the phone was saying to be honest like you have to have some like if you don't have this protein or enzyme like you can have a higher chance of a bad experience and they have to like know that but whatever so I had to go there like almost two hours before the appointment to get my blood drawn and then we were just kind of waiting around for an hour and a half before my appointment time and we like went for a walk and I had something to eat and I was just like kind of like just very disconnected from the world I just felt like it was just so weird I was like it was just the only way I can describe it is kind of surreal and strange like the whole day and the morning leading into my appointment wasn't until like the mid-morning and we had gone to the hospital probably like nine o'clock and so we were just walking around and not I think I feel like neither of us knew if we should talk about it or not talk about it Um, I had, I had my doctor prescribe like a heavy anti-anxiety medication because I was like, I'm going to freak the out. Um, and so I'm glad I had that. But like, I, I told Paul this when like we first talked that because of COVID, he couldn't come inside with me. And it was like the most, sorry, (laughs) it was just like the most gut wrenching feeling I've ever had in my life where like he walked me to the front door of the building and like basically dropped me off. And I mean, like he was hurting and I was hurting and kind of like that last hug that I gave him was like awful. It was, it was hard to walk away from him because it was in this moment. That was like the last time we were together with this, situation we were in it was last time that we were going to be together when I was still pregnant it was like the last chance for us to change our minds kind of 
Um, and then I just like had to walk through by myself and like, you know, I had my mask on and like went into the room and I was alone and it wasn't, you know, it was just such a weird feeling that I, it felt like such a big thing was happening for the two of us and the rest of the world was just carrying on. And it, I don't know how to explain that feeling really of just like looking around at everybody else just going about their day and knowing that I was making one of the biggest decisions of my whole life, um, which was really hard. And then I don't know how much you want me to say about stuff, but like I got upstairs and they like did all the consent forms and everything. And like, you know, I had headphones on and I mean, it was incredibly painful. I was like, crying and like trying not to scream because I didn't know what other rooms were filled with other people and I didn't want to like scare people that were you know doing other things very considerate like, of you yeah I was trying yeah, to I, I love be, that you're, you're okay. going through this massive moment and um, and you're thinking about other people yeah yeah and I feel like I also felt bad like so they haven't I, I didn't I don't know if anybody does this. everybody has this experience like they had a nurse come in whose sole job was to like stand next to me and hold my hand okay and i think that was like that person to me was like the most important person in the world in that moment like it's hard like not not that i wanted to know medically or physically what was going on but also like it feels very separate when you're like in that room and there's somebody behind this curtain down there doing this thing to you and there was a nurse standing next to me who was just trying to talk to me and talk me through it and holding my hand and I was like I'm sorry if I'm holding your hand too tight and she was like it's fine <laughs> you know and <laughs> I think it was also weird because everyone was like we were all wearing masks and it felt like a little bit disconnected sure. um yeah overall it was just a surreal experience and then I didn't feel very well afterwards so I like sat in the chair for a minute um and they gave me like this little thing to smell to make my stomach feel better. Um, and then, yeah, I just called my partner and I was like, all right, everything's done, you know? And then he picked me up and we got food and came home and that was kind of it. And it was just, I think it was weird to come home and talk to my parents that day because I was like, a, this horrible thing happened, and I'm feeling really emotional. B, I feel like I'm keeping this horrible secret from you, and I didn't really know how to like look them in the eye and try to be normal. You and think I think in the weeks, the, no. not, obviously not that, but do you think they knew there was something like they, they must like your parents are your parents? Yeah. So they must have yeah, known exactly. there was. I mean, obviously something not in the wild, the, yeah. the wildest I mean, imagination, but they're probably thinking, yeah, Olivia is not quite quite right yeah. today do you think I they think, noticed or do you think you hit it well it's hard to say because my parents and i don't really talk emotionally like we're not very close like that so even if they noticed something they probably wouldn't have said anything to me mm -hmm. to be honest um it's hard to say i think my partner and i just tried to like keep to ourselves that day and he spent the night here and we tried to just like go through what we needed to go through. And I think that night was one of the worst nights. Like, I mean, this is like kind of dark, but like I, I've had a lot of like issues with my mental health prior to this whole experience. And my partner knows about everything and you know, whatever. And I have a very good treatment team and I was emailing my therapist like throughout the day and I got home and I was like in a very, very, very dark place. And I emailed my therapist and she called me and my partner was there with me. And she was like, you know, everyone was, I think who knew what the situation was, was like worried about my safety at that point. And my therapist was talking to my partner and he was, she was like, I need you to just be with her. I don't care if she's in the bathroom. I don't care if she's in the shower. I need you to be there when she's taking her meds. Like I, you know, it got to that point of just like horrible, horrible pain not not physically. I mean, yeah, it was painful, but that wasn't the worst part. The sure. worst part was the emotional pain by far that day. Yeah. Can you describe what that feels like? Those emotions, if if it's even possible. Yeah. I mean, it's it's almost 
in the moment when it was i i cried like as soon as it was done i was just like sobbing and sobbing in the like exam room um and it was it's hard to describe because part of me felt very like disconnected from myself almost like i was like out of my body you could say that like it just didn't feel really like, real everything felt just like disconnected and I think I had this like idea in my mind that I was either going to be regretful or relieved. And that's like, not what happened. I was very much like part of me was relieved and part of me was really sad. And part of me felt really guilty. And part of me felt really unsure if I made the right choice. And like so many different things were going on. And I think like it wasn't really real until that moment where I was like, I walked into this room and I was pregnant and I walked out of this room and I'm not, but there's no, there's nothing here. There's nothing to show for it. Like, I think, and like having to go through it all, not by myself, but like kind of in silence, like being at home and just having to go about my life as if everything was fine and normal. It was those emotions that day, just overwhelming. I think, there were so many emotions. Like I can't really pinpoint all of them, but the main thing I would say was just, I was overwhelmed by all the emotions I was having. Like there was so much going on and so many thoughts, like that I just felt so overwhelmed that I like, didn't know what to do with myself really. Where, where are you now with, in that journey with those emotions six, seven months later? I mean, I think it definitely got worse before it got better. I think throughout the summer, it was really dark. Um, when I, I went to school out of state, and it was the first time I'd been back to school for like two or three years. It was the first time my partner and I had been apart for that long because I was five hours away. So he wasn't really like, he came to see me twice. Um, and that was really, really dark. There were a lot of times over the summer where I was like, you know, everyone was kind of like, do we need to take Olivia to a hospital? Like, is she going to be okay? Is there something that we really like need to be concerned about that she's going to hurt herself? Um, and I think so many times where I just was really sad and like had to grieve. I think it's hard for me. I don't know. I'm trying to like articulate everything that was it's happening, okay. but you did a fantastic we don't, ex yeah, um, <laughs> we don't expect you to, you, you're doing better than I would. So. Okay. 100%. Thank you. I'm like, I get nervous that I'm like rambling, but oh, I no. think I, I worry about that all the time. Don't <laughs> okay. worry. I'll ever... I message Paul in between. Uh, Cause obviously we have, we do, we do take breaks while we're recording these and yeah, I, I messaged Paul saying, am I talking too much? And so even like I've been doing, I've done 10 episodes of this now and <laughs> yeah. I'm still like, am I, am I talking just too much? Mm -hmm. um, no. So you're not rambling. Okay. Everything that you're saying is completely valid. 100%. Okay, cool. and, uh, and we, we want to hear your story. We want to we hear do. what uh, you, really do. what you sure. think. So yeah. the fact that you can't pinpoint it is part of that whole, just where your head was at. Like you, you can't yeah. pinpoint it because you don't know how you felt. So that's okay. Yeah. So like, um, yeah. I think like emotion wise, I think I'm in an okay place now. Like after I came home at the end of school and I mean, I, honestly, my anxiety and my emotions were so bad that I came home a little bit early. Um, I mean, I finished my semester on zoom, but I came home about four weeks early. Um, because it was really hard to be going through all of it really isolated by myself. It wasn't like something, obviously I would like tell people and like, there's only so much relief you get from talking over a FaceTime or a Skype call. And like, even with therapy, like it's a very different experience to go to therapy over zoom versus in person. And I think like, I'm very much like physical connections really important to me. And like not having that I think was really detrimental. And like, there were times where I literally was like, I'm never going to feel better. I was like, I'm going to be sad and depressed about this for the rest of my life. Um, and there were, I mean, honestly, I think, and I told my partner this, I was like, part of me feels like I will always consider this, like my first, our first kid, even though there was no, there's no kid, there's no baby, you know, there's none of sure. that. But, um, I mean, there was even a point where I was like, I became a little bit obsessed, ob obsessive about it, where I was like, s searching out things of like what was it like and what did what would the fetus have looked like and you know almost like 
and there was a point where I think I was like trying to punish myself by like purposely looking at pro-life things because I was like already feeling that way about myself and I was like yeah everyone else is thinking that about me too sure. and kind of like that self-punishment aspect and there were times where I mean there's there were times where I like literally couldn't look at myself in the mirror because I didn't want to look at my body because I kept thinking about what my body would look like if I hadn't had my abortion um and so I didn't want to look at myself in the mirror. I didn't really want to touch like my stomach area because it made me feel uncomfortable to touch it. And like, I was, yeah, it, it was just really hard. Like so much grieving of like, I, and there was a time where I remember saying to my partner and it was, it, I'll never forget it. I was like, I feel like I murdered our baby. And he was like, that's not at all what happened. Like, you know what happened and that's not what happened. And I think like, getting so sucked into those emotions and it's hard for me to say the word like grief because i feel like that is what happened but it almost feels like i don't get i don't deserve to use that word in a way because Why? some i i feel like and i i wouldn't say this to anybody else i don't want anyone who's listening to feel like this is that is what i'm saying to them this is like how i'm saying this to me of course and i like the last thing i would want is someone listening to be like okay. oh my god i don't get to use i've been using the word grief and i shouldn't but that's not at all what i'm saying um, what I'm saying is more like, it felt like I chose this outcome. And so I should like, it's almost as if these feelings and these thoughts that I have are like a punishment because I did what I did. And like using the word grief just seems inappropriate in a way because yes, I experienced a loss, but it's kind of a loss that I chose. Um, you, would okay. you say you were angry at yourself? Or? I never had a point where I was hateful towards myself or like angry at myself i think overwhelming sadness and like overwhelming fear of like that i did something wrong and overwhelming fear that my partner was gonna feel that regret and blame me and hate me for it okay i i think i blamed myself i don't think i would i was angry at myself i think i blamed myself because like having the IUD like I was the one who gave my partner so much assurance that it was all gonna be fine that like we didn't have to worry because I have an IUD and everything's fine and so I think when I found out I was pregnant I was like I not only did this to myself I did this to this person who I love so much that I'm also putting him through this situation and I blamed myself for his emotions as well because I was like if I hadn't given him so much assurance and told him that it was fine for us to because I had an IUD that we wouldn't be in the situation we are now, you know? Um, so I think that was really hard. And I would always ask, him, I was like, do you resent me? Do you feel like I ruined your life? Do you feel like I, and he, he was just like, no, I feel like it takes two people to have this situation happen, you know? And we were, I think we obviously had very different experiences. And I think I'm not, I, I don't want to speak for him. He's obviously not here. I think a lot of the time he felt very hopeless, uh, not hopeless, helpless because it was during COVID. Sure. And I think for us at that most dire moment to have to be apart, I think affected both of us like in a very, very deep way. That thought did cross my mind um, while you were in the hospital and he's just dropped you off. And obviously he's he's got to fill that time until, until you message to say, yeah. you know, Come, come and get me like I can only imagine the things that are going through his head mm -hmm. during that moment um I mean what do you do like f for one you, you can't go you can't go very far like he's, he needs to be yeah. on call and ready for you yeah um so logistically it's a he, he can't go anywhere he's restricted he wants to be with you can't be right he, he's it's not like you can display you know i'm going to go bowling for the next yeah exactly minutes, you know, like, um yeah. so he's he's sitting thinking through everything thinking have i done everything right like i'm i'm putting these thoughts in his head i'm not i don't know what he was thinking but right um that thought did cross my mind when you were talking about it where he dropped you off like the other side of that story is yeah what sure. was he thinking like what was what was yeah what was he doing while you were going through one of the yeah. hardest things you'll have to do right i think it like yeah we've never he's a much more we deal with things very differently i'll say he's much more like 
internalizing of things. Like he'll, he keeps things inside a lot. Um, That's also been called so, a man. Yeah, yeah, I think, <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah, we internalize yeah. everything. It's like honestly been hard where I'm like, I need to know what you're thinking. I need to know what you're feeling. Like, yeah. I think I did beat myself up a lot being like, I'm thinking too much about it. It's been two months and I should be over it. And just because my partner's not talking about it. And he was like, I think about it. We just like have different ways of processing things. And I was like, I need you to tell me, I need you to tell me that you're, you don't tell me what you're thinking. I need you to tell me that you're still thinking about it. So I don't think I'm crazy or like, I don't be like, or then I was like nervous to bring it up to him because I was like, he doesn't talk to me about it. Am I going to like make him upset by bringing it up if he's not thinking about it? And so I think that was hard, but we definitely, and I think also like I've tried to remind him that like, yeah, I had that physical experience, but you were part of it too. You don't need to downplay how you felt because you were part of it. And like kind of back to like the emotions, like now that I'm thinking more about it as I'm talking, like there was also this huge feeling of like emptiness, like emotionally and physically, which sounds weird to say, but like, it's not like my body had changed at all, but like I felt very empty and I felt like something was missing and I felt like I had this void that had to be filled afterwards which is really indescribable but like it just all I can say is like it felt like there was something missing now like there was just like a missing part um which was like weird and that part is pretty much over with for me but like there were times where I'd find myself like putting my hands on my stomach like as if something was there um which was kind of strange but um and like weird to say out loud because it feels kind of strange but um yeah just like so all over the place it's hard to yeah it's hard to say thank you for thank you for because, sharing, um, you've done a fantastic job so many things are going through my head obviously i'm hearing your emotions your thought processes for the first time um and i'm i'm trying to to reconcile my how it affects me because that's how what people do we're like oh, how does your story affect me um and all I keep coming back to is that I hope that your exploration of your thoughts and feelings in this podcast helps somebody else yeah. to feel it's okay to feel, to feel like that, that, um, that they, they think on listening to your story and listening to specifically your emotional journey that you've just laid out for us, that it's okay not to be okay. It's yeah. okay to to feel conflicted it's it's okay to not understand how you feel and all yeah. these different things that you've explained to us um I, that, that's all i can keep coming back to is i hope to goodness that your story helps somebody else to to feel okay now that's yeah. Me too. olivia it's been a fascinating journey finding out so much about you and as ryan said thank you so much for everything you've shared i want to take you back to the day you had your procedure or just following your procedure and the decision that you you made not to tell your family what do you think would have happened had you gone home and said bearing in mind what you've said already about you not having the best sort of emotional relationship with your family mm -hmm. hi guys i've just had an abortion yeah I think, I don't think, honestly, I think I was more worried about my mom being like, you should have been more careful. Like, why are you, why were you so reckless? Why were you being stupid? And not about the abortion part. I think the, the abortion part was not what I was worried about. I think if she had thought I was pregnant, she would have said you should have an abortion. So it wasn't like, I think they were uh. going to judge me for that. I think they definitely would have been like, you should not have a kid right now. You should have an abortion if they had known. I think that my mom would have been like, why are you being stupid? Why were you so reckless? Um, yeah, that was kind of my only fear. And I also like, with my partner's family, it was kind of another can of worms. He has a rough, like, I think it's more complicated for him. His mom was, had his older sister around like my age. And so I think she would have been like, well, I could do it and I, mm -hmm. you know, don't regret it. And like, what would have happened if I had aborted your sister kind of a thing? Um, also, his stepdad is Catholic. And so that was a whole other and he already is not a fan of me. So oh. I really didn't want to add that to the mix. 
Um, but yeah, it just seemed like it seemed kind of like we don't need their support. Like it had been one thing if I was like, yeah, we're having a baby and like, we need you to help us financially. We need you to do X, Y, and Z. I need, you know, and I think for us, it was kind of like, why get them upset about me being pregnant when it's just going to end? There seemed like no point to put them through that kind of emotional roller coaster of anger and sad, you know, the whole thing. So yeah, it just kind of, it kind of seemed like there was no benefit to telling them. There was only really downsides. Okay. Will you ever tell them? I don't know. I think that's really hard to say. We've talked about, we haven't really ever talked about telling them. There was time when my partner was like, oh, I really want to tell my older sister. Like I, I almost told her and I was like, you could tell her. Like, as long as you tell me, our rule mm -hmm. is kind of like, you can tell who you want to tell as long as you tell me who you're telling is kind of like our thing about it. Um, but we both kind of decided to get it. Like, let's not tell the families. Let's kind of like keep it. Friends are fine, whatever. Um, sorry, I don't know what I was about to say. <laughs> um, but I just like started talking and then I was like, I don't know where I'm going right now. Um, That's every, but, every sentence I see. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just think we actually, here's what I was going to say. I remember now. Um, <laughs> We haven't really talked about telling our parents eventually. We've actually talked about if we would ever tell our future kids, which has been like an interesting conversation. Wow. Um, kind of deciding like, would we ever tell our kids about what happened? And our thought process was like, yeah, like I think we we both want to do things differently than our parents did. We, you know, I think everyone kind of does a little <laughs> bit. Um, and so, although inevitably we like, do tend to turn into exactly. our parents. I hear yeah, it all the time exactly. coming out of my mouth. Things right. I say to my um, kids, I'm like, oh my God, mm -hmm. I'm becoming my dad. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like, that's been an interesting conversation of like, we don't want our kids to feel like they would have to hide something like this from us. Kind of like how we feel like we have to from our family. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's kind of the thing, like now that we're moving forward and healing from it and it almost feels like it'd be more painful to have to hash this out with our families now or in the future, yeah. unless there was a reason, you know, it doesn't really seem like something I'm dying to tell them in any way. It's almost like the, the moment where it could have been useful or helpful or the reason mm -hmm. has, has passed. So yeah. In the, in the time, like when I was pregnant, there were times where I just wanted to like shout at them. Cause I was like, I was crazy for the week and a half I was pregnant. I was like so angry and irritable and like, sick like i was just nauseous and tired the whole time i remember my mom like there was one night my mom made dinner and it's normally like this dinner that i love it's like this like chicken with all these like spices it's so good but anyway the smell started making me feel like so ill and she knows it's a dish that i love and i like didn't want to eat it and she was like getting kind of sussed out <laughs> and i was like i'm just not feeling well like i'm just not hungry and there was a moment where she was like are you sure you don't want more and i was like I just want to be like, I'm pregnant. Stop. Leave me alone. Sure. But that was the only time where I like really desperately <laughs> was like, stop, get out of my face. Like, because my parents were like, why are you so irritable? Like, why are you so angry? And I was like, I'm just tired. <laughs> but I wanted to be like, I'm pregnant. Leave me alone. Um, but yeah, I feel like that moment that it would have been helpful is kind of passed. Okay. You spoke before when we spoke pre previously, you said something that really struck me and I wanted to, to ask you about it just now. You said that you didn't picture this happening with a proper partner. What did you mean by that? I think in my mind, when I've thought about like having an abortion, there was never a time. My idea of necessity was never the reality of necessity my idea of like the necessary, like, oh, I need to have an abortion was because it was with a partner that was like a one-time thing okay. or someone I was just like casually hooking up with. It was never in my mind, like I would need to have an abortion because even though I love this person and I picture myself having a life with them, I don't want to have a kid right now. That it sounds like very naive when I say it now, but like in my mind, in my, you know, younger years of like, 
being a young adult and like being an adolescent, I was kind of like, well, if I ever needed to do this, it would be for like these five reasons and these five reasons alone of like <laughs> someone I didn't want to have a future with. Someone was like a one-time thing, you know, X, Y, and Z. And for me to be like, wow, I think it just made the decision so much harder because I think if it had been with someone who I was like casually hooking up with or whatever, it would have been like an easy decision. Not easy. It's never easy, but like it would have been easier. Whereas for me to be with someone who I'm like, I really could see myself spending my whole life with you and like marrying you and having a family with you to have to also make this decision, which is not a situation I really pictured myself in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess it must be easier to look back having had the experience to say, like you say that it would be, you know, I had these perhaps five reasons where it would be okay and then sort of real life comes along and boof, suddenly right. all that thought process goes out the window. I, I can speak, I'm not sure about you, Ryan, but about overanalyzing, overthinking and and my mind going crazy and, and then something like that actually comes along and suddenly all that worrying and all that planning almost seems unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Best laid plans never kind of work anyway. Right. I, I find you're always adapting. <laughs> So, yeah, you never kind of know, do you? Of course. Um, you don't know how you're going to react unless you're in a situation. Like, I right. I could I could say, till I'm blue in the face, like, oh, I'm going to act in this specific way if this specific thing happens. And then when it comes to it, fight or flight might click, kick in and I might act in a completely different way or, you know, right. anything. So it's hard to plan for. And it, it, the other thing is perspective. Um like perspective is a massive thing like your perception of a situation paul's perception and mine in a certain situation would be different because yeah. we're different people with different thought processes with different maps of the world that we've created through our experiences so i think perception is definitely a thing which is which is shown because of all the difference of opinion between pro-life and anti-abortion and uh like these different pe- different people have different thought processes is what I'm saying. So yeah. it's all to do with perception. And um, I've spoke about this before with Paul, but that whole Steve Jobs Stanford speech thing um, where he talks about you can, can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back. Yeah. yeah. Um, that means a lot. That always resonates with me. Um, I don't know if you've seen the Stanford P. Have you watched it yet, Paul? I do talk. I've, about I've it seen time. bits of it. Yeah, I think I, I saw it before you first referenced it. But yeah, yeah it totally, uh, totally clicks with me as well. Resonates. Ah, uh, yeah, the Steve Jobs Stanford um, speech. If you've not seen it, then or if you've not heard it, then I would encourage yeah. anyone listening to this to go and do that. Um, mainly just because he speaks quite eloquently about like fate and decision making processes and how things tend to just work out the way they're supposed to mm-hmm. if you are true to yourself. So yeah. um, whether that's true or not, I'm still yet to experience that. I will connect those dots when I look back later. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, exactly. it, it works I'm hoping it is. I'm hoping with 2020 hindsight, or okay, getting rid of 2020. Don't say 2020. Yeah. Um, Let's call it 2021 hindsight. Yeah, yeah we're going to have to change that. <laughs> That's going to need to be a new saying. gone. <laughs> How should I say 2021, thanks, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's 4040. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, Olivia, sort of starting to, to draw things to a close, but again, thank you so much for sharing. It's been, it's been fascinating. And we met online, we met through Reddit, um, and I've reached out because I thought your story was was one that would be really really worthwhile to to delve into and to share for 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 others to benefit from. What has your experience been like sharing your story online? Because I know it's been it's been possibly the main outlet for you. What's yeah. it been like? I mean, the only place I share about it is on Reddit because I want to only speak about it in an anonymous format Uh, i'm very open about other parts of my life on various social media um like i when i was in high school i the first time i tried to go to university as you all call it over there we call it Um, college we call it college if you like okay all right cool i feel like we have college too yeah we do we do all right we got them both um well when i the first time i went to college i developed like a very severe eating disorder and left college and like that part of my life is like all out there everybody knows about it i talk about it very openly um 
I talk about, you know, my struggles with my mental health a lot, but this is the one thing that's like my deepest secret that I don't talk about anywhere else other than Reddit because I want to be anonymous. Um, and so I think, but it is very comforting to know that there are people out there who think like me and have had similar experiences and struggle with the same emotions that I do um, because there's nowhere else I really talk about it. And I think like, it's really interesting how people have had such similar just thoughts and emotions about it. Like, I think it was, I posted a specific comment, Paul, and like right after I posted it, you messaged me. I don't know if this was the one that sparked it, but someone was talking about the holidays and talking about going through the holidays, thinking about what it would be like if they had gone through with their pregnancy and like I remember. what the holidays would be like. And I think that really struck me as like, wow, like I'm not the only person who thinks about these very like mm -hmm. specific instances. And like, I was talking about how like my aunt, is pregnant and we became pregnant about the same time and I see her and sometimes I like have this overwhelming sadness like confusion feeling of seeing her and being like whoa that's what I would look like right now and that's how far along I would be and this is how developed my child fetus chi it's a weird thing to call it a yeah. child I don't know it's another weird thing but anyway <laughs> Um, like my partner and I don't use the B word. Like we don't call it a baby. That's kind of like our unspoken rule. Okay. Um, but it, it's just weird that to see that kind of stuff. And then, but it is nice that there is an outlet for it online. And I don't think the, I think I, I'm the fear of like sharing on there is mostly gone. I don't make my own posts, but I comment on other people's, but it is nice to see people being like, I'm feeling this way about the holidays. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm not the only person who is like, sometimes imagining this other world in my head of sure. what my life would be like right now. Like I do find myself sometimes like, I wouldn't call it daydreaming, but like I picture this parallel universe of like, I still <laughs> went through with my pregnancy and like, it's the holidays now. And like, here's what it would be like. Um, but it, it's a really nice thing to have because there's no real other place out there like it. Like the, the things that I read are mostly political or they're, just trying to be like don't have an abortion it's not really like a support any kind of support really it's not really ex in existence um so but i think like i've only had one person like i had one person message me something just like mean other than that though it's like yeah i mean it's just the fear i think has gone away of like oh my god what are people gonna think i think it's mostly just like a place of comfort where i'm like I'm really not alone and however I think and feel is valid. Good. My, 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 when we first connected, I think com quite rightly so, you were you were very guarded and you were very unsure as to what our intentions were. And, and I was I was expecting that. And I, I almost feel comforted to know that you haven't had a huge backlash. I was almost expecting you to say, yeah, it's quite good. At, you know, it's, it's a release, but also here's the other side of the coin where I get this mm. amount of messages per day and, but your experience hasn't been that way. Yeah. I think it's because I don't make my own posts. I just more like a comment person. Okay. Um, but like, even when you join the Reddit, like in the little description box, it says like, be prepared because this might happen. It does. Which yeah. is just like really saddens me. Like deeply, deeply saddens me. People just want to have their opinion sometimes and it's not always right. good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes without sort of due care for how yeah. someone else might interpret it or. Right. Feeling. yeah but when paul messaged me i was like what is this am i about to you know i was like <laughs> what am i getting am I into get sucked in and like some I'll find random myself, guy yeah yeah i'll find myself on some propaganda website in 30 days um but no i think like i feel bad about it now i was like i was so cold i feel like i was mean please but, don't um, <laughs> i'm I hardened to it <laughs> yeah no because <laughs> It's not not to scare you any, uh, any further, but like it would be so, it would be quite easy for us to abuse this privilege that we have, where that you have afforded us. That yeah, that you have you have come on here and you've been open and honest with us. And if we were less open and honest with you, and we we had nefarious like reasons for doing this, well, it would be very easy of us to take your well. We could we by not making it anonymous for a start we could be doing that well we're not going to do that but that's the kind of thought processes that i'm sure you had like oh these people could do anything with my likeness anything yeah. with my voice anything with my story and make it look um however they wanted to look yeah exactly take it out of context 
Um, yeah. We, of course, are not going to do that. And we're yeah. just really happy that you've you shared with us. And, and trusted us. And yeah. Um, and that's the thing. is, There has to have been a bit of trust there because, and obviously Paul has <laughs> done a good job of, of making sure that your fears were like yeah, definitely. put to the side. But, I do, I um, need a promotion. <laughs> to what? What would you actually be promoted to? CEO. <laughs> you can be CEO if that makes you feel better. Paul. Thank you. Okay. Can I get a badge? <laughs> you can. You can have a badge. I will send you a badge. Oh. Olivia, could you make a badge for Paul, please? Oh, well. Sure, absolutely. I'm going to wait for that. I'll give you my address after this. <laughs> the, Olivia, it's, it's art that you're doing at, at college, oh, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So well, the, you see, yeah. she could definitely design you a badge. Paul, I'm expecting a masterpiece. I, I mean. Uh, Kind of like not to make it serious and like you know, but I I also think that was like very much a way that I'm able to express how I've been feeling about everything is like through art, and I think that's like something for me that's like very healing and like being given like sometimes I do this thing in school. I'm not gonna lie, where like I somehow manipulate my assignments into making it so I can do things I actually want to do and ignore <laughs> what the prompt is and still get a good grade. Um, and so oh, we yeah. had to do. Yeah, we, I also, everyone makes fun of me. I'm not a drawer. I hate drawing. But we have to take a drawing class for like our first year. And everyone makes fun of me because I don't draw feet, hands, or faces. Um, and everyone like gives me such a hard time because of the worst things to draw. And I just don't want to do it. Um, but anyway, I made, we had to do a self portrait. And I wanted to make a piece about my experience, and, like what I'd been through. And I talked to my professor and I was like, so can I just not draw my face? And she was like, um, it's a self portrait project, but like, if you want to try, you know, go ahead. Mm -hmm um but like through that process um like i made a new drawing of myself and it was very difficult to like because i i told you before like i had been having a hard time looking at my body and like through that process i think like i was able to do a lot of like work with myself about like learning how to cope and move forward and like i think i'm grateful to have that like outlet to you know to use as Good. well i'm glad just as a side note, do you think your art has mm -hmm. been better um, in certain aspects because of the experiences that you've just had in the? Uh, it's actually kind that... of funny. No, go ahead. What were you saying? No, I was just saying they say that like um, your life experiences do translate to your art. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, that was my question. Do you... I was going to uh, say we should I, ask, the, actually... ask your professors. They'll tell us. Yeah. I mean, they... <laughs> You know, I, I'm not to toot my own horn, but I have a 4.0 GPA as of now. So I'm trying to like, you know, which is like perfect, perfect scores. All oh, I'm, across I'm the glad board, you explained that. I had no idea what yeah. 4.0 GPA oh, was. Yeah, <laughs> okay. well, when you rate it, the highest you can get is okay, 4.0. So okay. I'm not trying to toot my own Smart horn, cookie. but um, anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think it's actually interesting that you brought that up because back when I found out that I, well, supposedly was not going to be able to have children, the school that I was applying to has this like infamous assignment that they give out that's like incredibly vague. Like it's it was just like the assignment, like for your application, I mean. So the assignment so that you had to submit a portfolio and whatever, and the assignment that they gave us was like make a piece of art about something that occurs in nature and then make another piece of art out of the first piece of art. What? That was the prompt. It was just like the most vague thing I've ever seen. Um, and so I made a piece about that experience of like not being able to have children. Um, and I, they must have ate it up because it was a white circle <laughs> on a black canvas. And I just winged it and was like, we're going to hope for the best on this one. Um, but they, you know, and so I think like I used art in that aspect. And I do think my art has changed a lot. Like, I don't know if it's gotten better or worse or different i think like my art making has taken so many turns over the past couple of years with just like the experiences i've had between my eating disorder and then my experiences with my pregnancy and abortion and all that stuff like there have been so many different you know ebbs and flows and curves and i think yeah i mean just i feel like i'm going off topic a little bit but um yeah i, just yeah, I asked the question so you do yeah. you feel free um, <laughs> yeah i just okay. think it's been an interesting way to like look back and see you know things like that but i think it's changed and i have like much more introspection on like how to convey my feelings because i think having my abortion was the it's been the most difficult 
time I've had explaining my feelings about it. It's very, very challenging to explain my feelings. And I think like through my art, I was able to try to convey a little bit about what was happening in my head. That was hard for me to say into words. Yeah. It's good that you had it out there. Um, I think it's interesting and I hope other people do too, um, that like obviously it's that life, that life imitating art and vice versa thing. But if you, if you've experienced something quite traumatic or quite poignant in your life, that you're able to transfer that to your work, um, mm-hmm. it gives you an outlet. It gives you something to do. I mean, we do this is technically an art form, and this is our right. outlet that we have, Paul and I. Um, so, I mean, we I, I suppose we kind of understand in that way. And the reason why I asked the question was it's, it's interesting to me to see how these experiences affect your real life as well yeah. as as your outlet so yeah it's, it's i mean I definitely like in my life a lot of oh my god my dogs are running up to the car my dad just let them out <laughs> little idiots um <laughs> she every time i'm in my car my dog thinks we're going for a hike oh, no, <laughs> um <laughs> just like when my partner he always takes them my partner always takes them on hikes even when i was at school and every time his car's in the driveway she's like freaking out oh. thinking that we're going somewhere um anyway it shows you how clever dogs um, are right yeah, no, she's dog smart, the... but she's, yeah. she's, she's, she's a brat. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, anyway, I think like, oh, shoot. I mean. <laughs> I knew oh you were going to say that. I don't know what's wrong with me today. I know. Um, but yeah, I think it's been, I think it affects a lot more aspects of my life than I thought. Like, especially like more, it, it's not as big a problem now, but like in the beginning, I had a hard time just like, I couldn't really look at children when I was like out in public. Like I would see families interacting and it made me feel very uncomfortable and like upset. Like when my partner and I were at the beach and there was like these two little kids and this, like just watching the dad interact with his children, like made me feel so upset. But I like in the beginning couldn't really, it's just like, it's crazy how it's like infiltrated so many parts of my life. Um, But that's like, that's, it's dissipated a lot now. It's like less frequent that it comes up, but yeah okay that is it's, it's fascinating how one event if you can call it that mm-hmm. then impacts on everything else yeah. in your life in some respect i've almost saved i don't know if it's the best or the most challenging question to last um, after this whole I, I don't know that i don't have the word for it but this conversation it's been so enlightening and, and so i'm so grateful for you to for sharing it with us and I want to ask you if you can in any way summarize what would you tell someone else who is in the position that you were in a few months ago? I bet you what's going to happen after I answer this question is we're going to hang up this phone call and I'm going to think about like eight other things <laughs> I probably should or would have wanted to say. I'm that kind of person. Um, so but I. I think like I'm also probably going to get very emotional, but I think okay. like there like i i said a little bit before like there's not there's not a right answer like there's not a general right answer and there's a, not a wrong answer it's whatever is right for you i think like that's something that i really have to focus on is like whatever is right for you if you're doing it for you but that you're doing the right thing you're doing what is best for you in the moment even if it feels really hard even if it feels like neither option is the best option or the good option, whatever you choose to do because you feel it's right is right. And you shouldn't doubt that you made the right choice for you at the time. Um, I would also say that like whatever you're feeling and whatever emotion you're going through is valid. There's a big spectrum of emotions in the world. And I only thought it was going to be regret or relief. And there's a lot more things in between that. There's a lot more things outside of that. And so whatever you're feeling and wherever your emotions and your thoughts take you during or before or after or whatever you're going through, like it's valid and it's okay. However you're feeling, if you're feeling nothing but relief, if you're feeling happy about it, that's good for you. And if you're feeling sad about it or you're feeling that grief, like that's okay. There's no one way you're supposed to feel after something like this. It's, you know, you're doing the, the right choice, no matter which choice you make. Um, if it's the one you're making for you, um, And there's a lot of people out there who have been through the same thing. And even if you feel really alone right now, or you feel really, yeah, you feel really alone, 
you're not you're not alone you're there's a lot of people who have been through this too and there is a time where it's going to feel better than it does right now if you're in that difficult place like it feels really really dark if you're in a place of grief because that's how I have felt and still feel sometimes and there is you know it's not going to stay that way forever. Like it sounds really corny, you know, the whole, it gets better thing, but I, I really truly believe that there is like another side and there's life after your abortion. If that's the way you choose to go there, there is your life will be able to carry on in a meaningful and joyful way. And it's not like the end of joy. And, you know, you're not, I think the main thing that, I want someone to hear is like, you're not a bad person for what you're doing. Even if people out there are telling you and you're seeing things on the internet that are telling you you're a bad person, I can promise you a hundred percent. I don't know who you are, but I promise you're not a bad person. You're a really good person with a good heart. So I'll leave it at that before I cry more, but yeah. No, I think that's, (laughs) I think that's going to be helpful for, again, at least one person, um, probably more. And we've talked about this before, and um, I will reiterate with Paul right now, but um, we can only make decisions on the information we have at hand now, in the moment. And you touched on that there where you said if it's a decision you've made in the moment and it's right for you in that moment, that's the decision you've made. So you you can only make a, a choice based on the information you have readily available to you in that time period retrospectively doesn't matter you can't you can look back and you can have regret you can look back and you can be relieved if those are the two spectrums the two two emotions in that spectrum yeah (laughs) but (laughs) as you said there's so many other emotions and you're going to look back and probably in 10 years from now you'll look back and it'll be different again but in this moment now or in the moment a few months ago that was the information you had that was a choice you had to make and you made that choice for you for those reasons. So that's all you can do. That's all we do yeah. every day. People make decisions for their lives day in, day out, based on the information they've got at the time and their perception of that information. Everything else, either side of that, the the noise of other people, everything else, it is just noise because right. you're the one that's got to live with that decision. And you're the one that had all of the information to make that decision. I don't know what yeah. other things, other factors played into your decision-making process. Paul doesn't know what other factors you had playing into that decision-making process. And quite frankly, it's none of our business. Um, you made that choice for you. And that's that's the point that you, you said it a lot more eloquently than I did. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to kind of just not agree with you but just affirm that i feel that we do that for every decision right. that it's just what we what we've got in the moment what the information we have yeah. and that's how all decisions yeah. are made so why is this yeah. decision any different yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's almost easy to to look back and lament and regret and say oh i should have done this i should have done this differently but it's something i think i've learned as i've matured shall we say as i creep towards 30 um that yeah you can you can only do what you think was right at the time with the information you had and Mm -hmm. i think that is very relevant for what we've just said and like i even though i've been sad and i've had those really dark places of grief i don't regret what i did at all i I think i I 100 percent made the right choice good i you know i there's times where sure i doubt that and i will call my partner and i'll be like we did the right thing, right? And he'd be like, yeah, absolutely. Like even Paul, after we talked the first time, we're walking back in the house and I turned to him and I was like, we did the right thing, right? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. And like, there are times where I, I have those moments, but like, I can confidently say that I know I did the right thing, even with that grief. And so like, kind of again, if any, whoever's listening, like you can have the grief and the sadness and still not have regret and still know you did the right thing. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. That's it. No set of emotions are ever mutually exclusive. Right. It's a, yeah, it's, exactly. a net, it's a network of emotions. Like that's how our brains mm-hmm. work and everything's connected to something else. And um, I think 
I'm not a psychologist, Paul's not a psychologist, but there will be psychologists maybe that listen to this, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, there will go, there might be screaming at the the thing going, no, that is classic, whatever the terminology might be. Right. But um, for us, just normal people, real people talking about real stories, um, this is how, this is exactly how we um, work through those emotions, you know, just trying, right. just talking it out. Sure. And... And sharing, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Not to make a joke, sharing. but you guys should trademark the real people talking about real stories. That's a it's a good tagline. You should <laughs> we have it. We have it in our intro. But I don't know if it's trademarked yet. It is actually in our intro. Tra- yeah. yeah. <laughs> if it's not trademarked, you guys should trademark that because it was good. It's Thank a really you. Good one. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a copyright. I'm, gonna write I'm this. obviously not a lawyer of any kind, but. It seems like a good thing to do. Yeah, we appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tra- so trademark. Much. Look, you're writing it down. I don't know anything about how that works. I don't know anything about it, but neither you know. neither do we. <laughs> <laughs> we're and that is the problem. Too. Yeah, that is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're, we're just two idiots talking on the internet. Talking That's on the internet. We are. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia, thank you so much. Yeah, for absolutely. for sharing. Yeah, thank you all for having me. It's been. It's been a pleasure to a have pleasure. you. Pleasure, yeah, and we're so grateful. Yeah, for, yeah, thank you for your time. This I got a lot out of it too, so Good. thank you all. Hey, it's Paul. Thank you so much for checking out Life. Is it just me? Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube for the video version. Check out our website for the latest updates. Life is it just dot me. See you soon.